So welcome everybody to yet another Sydney IAMS gathering, which has now moved online. Uh, it's my great pleasure today, well, this evening in the USA, because we have a USA speaker, um, to introduce our featured guest. So Tamara Calder Richardson, also known as the Southern Bell Medium, is an evidential psychic medium, a channeler of Jesus, a spiritual teacher and a minister. And today she'll be speaking with us about her six. I think that's a, a record. I think Tamara's in her own club there. Uh, there's maybe one or two other people that have- There's a couple more. There's a, exactly. <laughs> so her six near death experiences um, and the gifts that she has received as an after effect from those, which are no doubt many fold. And she's also writing a new book, Love from Heaven. And she will be sharing with us all of that and so much more. So Tamara, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Nicole. I am so happy to be here and uh, I've been looking forward to it for some time. So Thank you all for having me. I know we were going to do this earlier and I came back from a cruise and I was terribly ill. And so thank you for being patient. I'll make sure that uh, hopefully it'll be uh, well worth it. So uh, I guess we should just start, dive right into the near-death experiences because you're probably wondering why six? And I get that a lot, you know, <laughs> why six near-death experiences? Because I do believe that what we have agreements before we came to this, uh, to this earthly plane, we had agreements. So uh, apparently I did make some agreements. And, and there's always the question I get, did, do, you know, do I have a problem? Do I need to keep going back for a checkup? Or, or do I really like it over there? And the answer is yes to both. <laughs> so I don't want to sell the other side too much, but yes, it's quite nice. So um, let me just dive right in. Uh, I'm going to just highlight most of them, except for two that are really, I think, kind of cool that I'll point out that I think really changed me kind of who I am now. Uh, uh, it's so nice to be at this point at this age and be able to say, oh, it all makes sense now, you know. So um, um, one of the, my first near-death experiences, I didn't realize was one till I read PMH Atwater. So if you don't know her, she's like the grandmother of near-death experiences and has written many, many books. But um, I had a prenatal and I do have um, cognitive memories of me not being in a body and my mother was hemorrhaging and not able to um, carry me. And I felt no connection to the body that was being formed in her. I just felt very sorrowful um, and compassionate toward her. And uh, I just remember how young she was and uh, the trauma she was going through and the sadness. So it was, it was interesting. I was just observing, but I remember observing things from um, different places in the house and then also out, going outside and looking. So I never really knew that was, I didn't know where to peg that, but apparently that's considered one. Um, at, but my first um, that I can recall, and I kind of have them bam, bam, bam in a row. I have one at three, one at four, and one at five. And at three, I was playing in the house with my, um, it was my cousin and we're playing hide and seek like kids do. And I got real excited. You know how kids squeal when they get excited, they go wee like a little pig. And so I'm excited and I'm jumping up and down and there, it was a, a large um, uh, kind of Victorian, but antebellum looking home, like you'd imagine kind of gone with the wind. And it was a nice house. I don't know what it was doing there, but there was an L underneath the dresser. And as I was bouncing up and down, it went through, uh, I bounced and it went through, there was an L there, uh, hammered underneath. I don't know why, but it pierced through my skull and I went like this and I thought it was water and it wasn't water and I passed out and I saw everything from above my body. And I saw all these beings of light popping in and they were, there was a staircase like gone with the wind. It kind of looked like that, you know, big staircase and they were popping in. And I mean, first of all, I'm three, how many people do I know at this point? Not a lot. And they were popping in. And then I had this being, it was about um, eight to nine feet tall, all light, very, very bright. Um, and I knew it to be my guardian angel. And I don't know why, but I knew it to be my guardian angel and <clears throat> their hands were over my head. 
I'm assuming healing me. And then I heard a disembodied, it was not just a disembodied voice, but it was a knowingness that permeated my ever being. It wasn't just a voice. It was just, um, it was beyond perception. It was just a finality of it, I, n like it was the voice. I knew it was a, it, it, it was, um, a, it was a presence. It was an all beingness. And it said, this is not your time. You have much to do. So all the beings of light started popping out, um, I'll pop, you know, go, well, wherever they came back from, they were leaving and I'm watching this from above. And I, long story short, my, my mother ended up, uh, my mother, <laughs> just like shake it off. My grandmother, my mom was very young when she had me at 18 and my grandmother, the matriarch showed up with my granddaddy and she, it just hit the ceiling, but she took me to a, uh, internist. And I recall, um, hearing medical terms and everything they said, I had a contusion and so forth and a watcher. So my head wouldn't swell. Um, uh, but I had a hole in my head two years. Um, look, it, it did work. If you want to connect with your crown chakra, it does work. I don't recommend it, but, uh, I was instantly, um, you know, connected, um, at three, I was seeing spirit people, but I didn't, I wasn't frightened of that because, uh, there were people I knew that had passed, but I didn't understand what passing was. Like I saw my uncle, uh, who had passed. And to me, I just, I didn't know where he went. I, I didn't know he died. Um, but I saw him, <clears throat> I saw him and they just seemed friendly. So it wasn't really at that point, really frightening or anything. Um, at four, my mom was dating this guy and she was from the small town Hickory, North Carolina. It's in, um, in the U S the Southern part and uh, foothills of the mountains. And, uh, not a lot going on there. So here's this flashy DJ, you know, good looking, bat, you know, the, the, the really, really into himself, flashy guy, flashy car. And she just had to have that man. So um, we were living with my grandparents. She wanted me to go on a date with him. And the weather was quite bad. It was uh, snowing, icy, very bad. And my grandmother did not want us to um, to leave. And at this point, I never really knew my real father. I didn't really meet him until 38. Uh, didn't really know. So he was kind of out of the picture. So she's dating this guy. We, he picks us up. Uh, we go out and I mentioned this in the chapter in my book, but, um, he had, he worked at a radio station. He was a DJ. And so he said, I have to stop by the station. So we stopped by, everything's kind of small there. And He's talking to my mother and they get into an argument. She wants to get married. He wants to get more money before they get married. And he, he told me I could get whatever free records or LPs I wanted. So I'm doing that. So we get, we were there, you know, for a while and then we end up leaving and they're really, they're arguing. So he puts on the brakes. We slide around, we hit a tree. I lodge up through um, the, it's an old Pontiac pre car seat when you didn't, it wasn't, you, it wasn't mandatory to have a car seat. And I wedged up into the, um, the window and it was a, it was an impact. And I, uh, instantly felt very cold and wet and didn't know where I was. And I couldn't understand where, where I was because I was not in my body. I couldn't understand where I was. Where am I? And I was forced down the tunnel. Now I understand that only 20 people percent, 20 percent only go down the tunnel. I went down a tunnel. I mean, it was just that's what it looked like. It was dark and I was forced down. It, it, it had the appearance of a dark tunnel. And then toward the end, there was a light and it was getting closer. And what it was, it was Jesus. And he had the hands, the marks in his hands, you know, the holes and his hair was, um, like he had a fan on it. Like he was in a rock video. That's what he looked like. <laughs> he had the fan on his hair and then he had people behind him. And as he got closer to me, he said that I had to go back. And at this point I'm like, well, I don't know. I kind of want to stay with you. And he said that I had to go back. And during this point, um, my mom, um, she was with, she was with this guy and, uh, I guess I was, uh, maybe, well, let's see, I guess that would have been, yeah, I, I guess I just turned four, but she, she had been with this guy and I didn't really want to go back because 
they were dating, but he already started sexually molesting me. <laughs> like it started then at three and a half. It was awful. And uh, went on to about 12 till I literally tried to fight back. Um, I was a problem child because I resisted quite a bit. I was mentally resistant. Um, but, um, and so I said, I can't do it. I can't go back. I don't want to go back. This is, I don't want to do this. And he said, you can, and you will. Like he was serious. And um, then he said, but I'll always love you. <laughs> but uh, So I did. And what was interesting though, that behind him were, I, I knew them to be relatives, but I didn't know them. I Meaning I had not met them in this life, but yet I knew they were relatives. And what was uh, interesting that I always thought was, um, that was special to me as a few months before that there was a, I thought it was a ball and it was outside and I threw it, but it was a bird's egg and I had killed a bird and I was, uh, that destroyed me that I would kill any living thing. And so there was someone behind him that yelled out and said, we have your bird, your bird's okay. <laughs> so to me, I thought that was so cool because it just uh, destroyed me as a kid. So, um, what was what was neat about that incident was when I did come back, uh, this is kind of some cool stuff here. So this is kind of neat. Um, I was, uh, when I came back, when you, when we talk about what reality is, um, well, the reality that we know it, it was the car, right? And I'm seeing it wedged into a tree on the driver's side. And these two good old boys were trying to pull it out. They had a wagoneer and they had chains are trying to pull it out. My mom is holding me, I'm unconscious. I'm uh, somewhat becoming conscious, but I'm looking to the right and I'm seeing, it almost looks like a rip in the universe. And I'm seeing, uh, again, that I believe to be my guardian angel. That's what I believed to know it to be. How, I don't know, that's what I felt it to be. Uh, not that I ever really heard that term before, but, and there, it was very, uh, this being was very, very bright and it was like an orange red, um, and I had always heard the name Uriel. I never knew later on until it was an, archa an archangel. I never knew that, but right beside me. And then I, I'm looking to the left, which I'm thinking that's unusual. Then I looked to the left, there was an old firehouse and there was all these spirit people outside and, and um, firemen that used to um, work there because they were dressed uh, in old timey fireman clothes, the thirties and forties. And they were just very friendly and checking on me. And then a lady sticks her head in the car, who's a spirit woman, and she had like a pillbox hat on. And she says, I'm Judith Hefner. And she began to say that my grandmother knew her mother and would go to her jewelry store. And then they just start talking to me. And then I look in the back and there's people that are sitting in the back seat. And one of them was a little girl named Catherine and kind of found out um, not too many years ago, I found out that my grandmother actually had another sibling that died at nine or 10 named Catherine, which I didn't know that. So that was kind of interesting. I didn't know who that person was. So I saw that going on. And then right. And so to the right was the angel being to the left was all these spirit people, like 300 of them was a lot. And then in front of me was a park. Now it's freezing, it's snowing, it's icy. So the park, you know, nobody's out there. But what I was seeing is they had, there was a native American, man and woman and a little baby and they were cooking a fish over a fire over a wooden stick and then i saw it looked like a gibson girl style woman with the tight waist long skirt with a baby carriage and then I, and then a guy with a top hat with her and then i looked up and i saw a hot air balloon so i was seeing different dimensions all happening at one time and i've seen this before and other near-death experiences so it really makes you ask what is past life? And with that said, I've had 300 hours of past life. So, but what's past, what's forward, what's, can we, can we cut in between time on, uh, maybe they're like what Jesus tells me, they're just segments of moments in time, but what order are they in? Would we really know? I mean, you know, cause, because I did see multiple layers of things going on. And then the uh, big one that I had when I was five, my, um, mom left our, uh, um, I guess my, my hometown in this Hickory, North Carolina, and my grandparents were there, which were my allies and um, watched over me. And so when we moved three and a half hours away, they were no longer there and the abuse became pretty heavy. And, um, you know, when I used to tell, you know, have my talks, I would never say this, but to me, I feel like it's so healing for people and especially, um, 
sometimes you can't remember your narrative experiences because they're lodged under trauma, you know, and, uh, and or childhood, some kind of childhood trauma, or, or could be a childhood illness, you know, it's underneath that. And uh, yeah, if you're missing uh, three, two or three days and you had a high fever, <laughs> you might want to look there. But they were, that's why it took a while for this to come out in my near-death experiences because they were hidden under all this. So um, we, moved, we moved away and I got a really bad sore throat and I had been praying. I remember grandmother, we, weren't, we didn't go to church or anything, but my grandmother talked to me about Jesus. She was very spiritual, kind of find out she had a lot of uh, gifts and she's a very creative person very uh, she would wear these colors I had her and she was very flamboyant I mean she looked like a little bird you know she has love colors and so um, she was very flashy especially for being in the south it didn't match like she she never fit in so um, so you know, I was there, and I didn't want to be in that situation. So I started asking. I remember this, you know, Jesus, can you can you just kill him? You know, but I didn't know that was a bad thing. And then I realized, well, he doesn't seem to be complying. Well, can you just take me? You know, so uh, I'm like, it really doesn't matter which one. I'm fine. Just take me. So I had kind of been willing myself because I didn't want to be in this situation. And uh, my mom was doing temp work, so she'd be gone and then leave me with him. And then it would start, and I would hide in the closet, and I would try to, it was awful. And so uh, my fever got really high, and was, and, and bottom line, it went from a, uh, 103.9 to close to 100, it was 104.9. And I lost consciousness, and I was soaking wet in the bed, and my mom kept begging my stepdad, he was at this point adopting me never really asked me, but just adopting me. And so um, to uh, take me to the hospital and he was like, no, we don't have the money, which we could have gotten the money. My grandparents have money, but he didn't. So it got really bad. Um, I went unconscious, I was burning up. So they put me in an ice tub, that didn't help. So eventually they did take me to the hospital. And it's funny, my mom never told me any of this. Um, and when I actually tried to talk to her about this about a year ago, um, she's like, I don't want to talk about this. And I'm like, it's okay. It all worked out. <laughs> but she, she didn't want to talk about it because maybe she was trying to protect me at that point. But um, what happened and how I got a lot of this information is it kept coming up in dreams. It kept coming through. And through the years, I got all this help. Most of my life, I would just spend so much money on myself with uh, healing type things to work on me. Like I always worked on me to like get rid of this. So as the layers came off like an onion, I began to see more and more of this. And the final bit, I got regression on because there's so much of it. And, uh, but, uh, but she never told me that I went to the hospital or anything. And so when I, in a nice way, but I confronted her with it, um, she couldn't understand how I knew all this because I was never told. Um, but anyway, um, I did go. It was the night that Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. So they had National Guard. You couldn't leave. And at this point, it was after 10 p.m. You were not supposed to leave your home after 10 p.m. And so we we're in his radio car, his PR car with the letters on it. And we're, we're out. And I literally die in my mom's arm in the car and I am watching everything going to the hospital above the car and I'm seeing riots in the distance. And then we have to go to a barricade to be let in. Um, you know, you can't just drive around and they said, why are you out? And he said, my daughter's very ill and they called ahead to the hospital. So the people waited for me, you know, when, I, when we drove up, they came and got me and I would be in the hospital room, be above the bed. I would see what they're doing. They, I heard the doctors talk, the nurses talk. There are about three or four nurses on and off that were working with me, two doctors. One said that um, I had, was uh, code blue. They said that I looked like a daughter that he has around the same age. And they, um, they, they could not, they were taking a lot of goop out of my lungs. I saw that. And they had a lot of medical terms, but they could not, they, they said they, they were talking about the CCs and all this. They could not get my vitals back. And they went and told my mom they couldn't get my vitals back, but I don't think that registered that I, I didn't have a pulse. But while this is all going on, 
is that I'm zooming through the hospital like a, like a bullet. It, it's like, I'm so free and I'm just observing. I'm not really emotionally tied to the body. I'm just observing everything. I'm just looking, I'm observing. I mean, honestly, I'm pretty content. I'm not upset emotionally by any of this. Uh, and I'm zooming down the hospital. I'm looking at the candy machine in the hospital. I'm talking to people that are just crossed like, Hey, how's it going? <laughs> I still talk to people all the time. So I'm still talking to them in spirit. Hey, how's it going? And uh, then I come back and check on my body. And as I'm roaming through the halls and I, it's so freeing just to not be bound to the body, just to be free. I'm looking at, um, there are spirit people there and very friendly, but there are two women and um, I guess it's like mid thirties, uh, candy stripe looking nurses outfits with the orthopedic looking shoes that like I used to wear pre-war, whatever that was. And they're uh, pushing a gurney. Nobody was on it, but they're pushing a gurney. And then they, they giggle and they said, hey, to me. And there was some 50s cop, 50s looking, like 1950s, um, painting. And he would say, dandy day, isn't it? So it was like these people, I kind of got the feeling they had worked at the hospital at one point, and now they're back still working. So here we have different dimensions interacting with one another. And then I go back and check on my body, and I see these two um, I knew they were Catholic because I, the rosary, even though my, we kind of grew up Presbyterian a little bit, you know, my, my grandmother, not really anyone else, but I knew that from the rosary and they were spirit people and there was a nun in there and she said, blessed are the innocent. And there was a priest with her. Uh, I think that must've been their job in life. And then they, you know, people take their job seriously. And then they came back, you know, to help me. I was a kid and uh, everybody's kind of crying and looks kind of sad. I didn't really understand why. And then I looked down and just in an instant, the whole scene changed from the hospital room and I'm this instantly, that's when I always say, children get a VIP pass to heaven. I'm just telling you, a VIP pass because instantly I was in a place that looked like paradise. I mean, it was the most beautiful, I mean, it was, there's no place you've seen that look, that looks prettier. I mean, the grass was so green. Uh, the flowers were so vibrant. Maybe that's why I still like colors, but the, it was, everything was so vibrant. And I looked down to the right and there was a man that was holding my hand. He was kneeled down and I said, you're that man I talked to. And he, it was Jesus. And he started laughing and he goes, uh, I am. And then I looked to the left and there were children playing on a seesaw. And he said, you have to go back. And I, and I was like, I, I, I refuse. I was like, no, I want to stay here. And he said, you have to go back. I said, yeah, but they're there. They're here. <laughs> the other kids, they're here playing. Why can't I stay with them? So he laughed. He laughs a lot. And it's funny because, you know, in like these pictures, he's so serious. He smiles and laughs a lot. He's got great teeth. You never see his teeth. And um, but he's like very, down, he's just a, like a regular person. He's so easy to talk to. Um, and so he said that he had something for me and I said a toy cause I'm five years old and he thought that was funny and he said no. And then he took to a piece of his, it was like, he had a rope belt and he took a piece of it, like a tethered piece of it off and wrapped it on my left hand, almost like a friendship bracelet. And, um, he said, um, uh, much is given, much will give and through uh, you, uh, let's see, I wrap you in my protection and love through the big things, the small things will be done. And through the small things, um, the big things will be accomplished. And then he, um, I kept begging. I was really making a fool out of myself. I was doing everything to stay. I was like, let me stay, let me stay, let me stay. And he's like, no. And then finally he, he said, I had to go back. And I said, why? And he said, because you need to go back and show your mother that you, of what love is. And I said, well, how do I do that? And he goes, well, it's something a little bit I know about. That's kind of funny. And he said, and there's really no right or wrong way to do it. And, and I said, told him, I was like, yeah, yeah, she'll be okay. <laughs> she doesn't need me. <laughs> it's funny now, my mom knows that. And she's like, gosh, and I'm like, I'm sorry. Jesus has dibs over you any day. I'm just going to tell you. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. And so we kind of laugh about it now, but um, he said, but you can stay for a little bit. And, and he showed me like, he showed me what she looked like, like almost in that movie, like with Jimmy Stewart, you know, I could see like her crying and you need to go back to her. 
And he goes, you have more love for yourself than she does for herself. So you need to help her. So I was like, okay. And so he said, but you can stay a little bit longer. So we walked and as we walked, every, um, blade of grass had everything had life every blade of grass every leaf every every flower petal everything was living and it was almost like like it was it, it like it had its own uh, life force every every dna was alive and they and as he walked the grass and the flowers and the clouds followed him and i was thinking does he know that's going on that seems really odd <laughs> because they were falling everywhere he went and so we sat under this, uh, we sat on this rock in front of this tree. It was really pretty and it was big. And I knew if I went past the tree, I couldn't come back. I just knew that if I, could, if I went past this tree, but the tree had um, almost like cherry blossoms, like a, a flower type thing, uh, or like where I am dogwoods or a cherry blossom. And then it had a uh, little red look like grapes on it. And he said, we don't eat from this tree. It's a wise tree. And I was thinking, well, I wasn't going to eat from the tree, but okay. And then he began telling me things. He said, I could ask him anything. And then he began to talk about um, creating and, and how they do things. He said in heaven, he said, we create by thought, but it's instant here. And, but it, it, but he said, but it takes longer on earth. And he said, uh, and it was like, we were talking about, it was like telepathy. It was really quick. And he, and I, he said, be careful, be mindful of your thoughts and what you say, because that's what you, that's what you manifest. So you, you want to be careful to be positive and, and, and be real deliberate about what it is you want because you, you manifest it. It just takes a little longer, but you're manifesting it on earth. And he said, but here it's quick because they do things over there. I said, okay. I said, well, uh, can I try? He goes, okay. So I'll visualize this being in a little boat. And then we were in a little boat and then uh, three fish came up. He picked one up, talked to the little fish and then he put it back down. He goes, this is how we fish here. And then we walked around. He talked some more. He said, I had to go back. I argued again, uh, which my husband says, of course you argue. Who argues with Jesus? I do. I don't know. But uh, I, I was so beautiful there. There was so much peace and so much love. I felt complete. I felt completely complete. There was so much love that was there. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a odd feeling because you could put all the people in the whole room that you love and there's no love that compares to that and the feeling of total acceptance. So um, I didn't want to come back, but I did. And he said, when he said I had to, I woke up and I was in this tent. They apparently put me in this um, uh, for my lungs, this, this, plastic tent and uh, but I wouldn't go right away I, I told him I said I would go back but what happened is I went back to the earth plane but I didn't go in my body because I was chicken that it would hurt so I went through the hospital trying to help people like an angel I thought I was an angel so I would go like help a lady who was giving birth and she was dying giving birth and I told her to hold, you know, hang in there because her daughter needed her. And then this old guy, no one would give him water. So I knocked his water off the table. So someone would give him some water. And so I thought this was like a great game I was playing. I could do this forever. This was terrific. And so Jesus got wind of this. <laughs> I was not in my body. And uh, he said that I had to get back. And I said, it, well, there was a doctor that showed up first, Dr. Tippin who was a spirit doctor, who must have been the administrator. And he said, little girl, you need to go back. And I'm like, whatever. And then so Jesus showed up. He said, you're going back in. And I'm like, no, it's going to hurt. I don't want to go because it's going to hurt. And he goes, I've prepared it already. And as soon as he said that, I'm back in my body. And it didn't hurt. I was fine. And, uh, and so I would say after that, I mean, I was definitely seeing from three on spirit people. Um, and I was communicating with them, but it wasn't a big deal because it's the only thing I ever knew. Uh, and then I had another near death experience when I was 10. <laughs> God, it's just like, you feel like you need a drum roll. And I, um, was playing, uh, uh in the pool on vacation, family vacay. And there were some guys playing volleyball and they were like 14, 15. And I was like 10 years old. So I'm looking at the boys and I get hung up underneath them. They don't know I'm underneath them. I can't get up. And I literally saw in the ocean, I mean the ocean, in the pool, um, the, it, well, we were on the ocean front, but I was in a pool. Uh, the, 
it was like white light horizontally opening up like this bright light coming through in the pool. And then I heard like a chorus of angels and I literally went, Oh my God, not again. And then I remember waking up expelling water. And, um, so that was that. And then I had another one when I was, uh, 28 and I w was, uh, told, uh, my old Tommy general practitioner, uh, gave me one pill for menstrual migraines and I had a reaction and I woke up in the middle of the night. I could not, I was married at this point, but I could not talk or wake up my husband. I had no motor skills. I don't know why, but I woke up and I went and turned on the TV, sat down. And within a few seconds, I didn't know it was a TV. Probably wasn't good. I good. <laughs> and I heard the and I was like, okay, this isn't good because I started not caring and I knew what was after that. Uh, I mean, I started feeling frightened and then I knew I wouldn't care. So I was frightened. And then I was like, I didn't want to get the point of not caring, but I started seeing the furniture in my house turn into lines, kind of like the matrix, everything started decoding. And then I was out in, in the galaxy. I didn't know it was male or female. I just was, and it just felt great. And, uh, but I knew that it wasn't my time and I knew that I didn't take too much. So I took one little finger and I poked my leg till I brought myself back in my body. And, uh, you know, then later I <laughs> pitched out the doctor <laughs> and, uh, you know, about that, but I, I guess I'm sensitive to things. I try not to take anything if I have to. Um, and that's apparently common with near death experiencers, but, um, you know, with all that said, uh, I just want to say a couple things to kind of wrap up and then we can kind of open it up. Um, why did that happen? Okay. I think we agree to things. We, I don't think we agree to, Oh, I'll agree to the cancer. I don't think that I think we agree to, um, yeah, I'll, I will agree uh, to learn humility and, and be a caring person. So we don't know what comes with that. Um, I definitely feel like that checking in so many times has, um, it really has heightened my, um, abilities. Um, I actually hid them. I owned an ad agency for many years and went to school for that. I, I ran an advertising agency and I'm a creative person and designer and writer and all that. And um, I didn't want any of this to come out. And in childhood, I definitely didn't want this to come out. It wasn't really, I think it frightened my mom. So, um, but what happened is uh, after years of meditating, being in prayer, and Jesus shows up. This has got to be on a t-shirt. And Jesus showed up because he all the time. And he, want, he wanted me to call me in for service to start letting people know heaven's real. And I was like, no, I did not want to come out. And he said it wasn't about me. It was about helping other people. Of course, he would say that. Um, but so that's what I did. I came out. And um, then I ended up, uh, because I decided whatever I do, I do it big. So I decided, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to take it seriously. So I studied with a lot of uh you know, famous international mediums like Tony Stockwell from the UK. And then I'm certified. I studied many times with Lisa Williams as well. And then John Holland from, um, from the US, Boston. And then Janet Novahack is a former nine. But I studied six years intensively, um, you know, to be, get that evidence, to get exact. And I just really put it out, you know, the, you know, really nitty gritty, get it out there. I wanted to do that. And, uh, you know, then this whole thing has come up this year especially with the pandemic, uh, I'm, I keep being pushed by the other side and I don't feel very comfortable with it. Um, but I do think that, you know, I definitely agreed to come back. Uh, what I agreed to in a, a short snippet um, is I agreed he wanted me to help put heaven on earth. And I told him that seemed like a lot of work. And he laughed. He said it probably is. But he said, but there would be other people doing that too all around the world. And I was like, well, okay. I mean, I had to agree to it. So uh, now the March 17th, um, Jesus wanted me to start giving messages. I'm like, great. People that know me know that he already shows up in readings. So does Mother Mary and some other people too, even though I'm not Catholic, she does, because the person may know, have that contact. And I've had other religions, their person, like Sai Baba has come through and uh, uh, this Indian lady I read. So, you know, but he, he comes through a lot, but to do it publicly, I did not feel comfortable, but he asked me March 17th. I told him no twice and I couldn't bear to tell him no a third time. So that's, uh, I've been doing these Jesus speaks and, uh, he's been giving, like, I have no control. He just gives the message of what's going on. 
And um, then I had this priest lady contact me and said, I'd really like to know, you know, uh, I've been looking at this stuff and then I'm getting channeled scripture, which I don't know scripture. And she's like, I really want to be a part of this. Can we do a Bible study? Now I got a pastor. Now they're looking at this. So I, I think what to me, what's going on, the veil is very thin right now. And uh, God's calling people, um, uh, all light workers, <laughs> attention, all light workers, step forward now, please. Uh, and he's telling people to be bold, to use, uh, however you, you know, you, you got to think, what is our purpose here? Our purpose is, a it's, uh, God, whatever the creator, I know it's not male or female. I say father just because it was what Jesus says, but I know it's not a sex. Okay. But it's God, the, that abundant love working through all of us and creating through us and, and that beauty coming through, whether it's music art, working with children, uh, whatever it is. And he's asking everybody to step forward. He's also telling people these days, um, he's, he's wanting me to teach people. I'm like, oh, great. To listen at night, because a lot of people aren't sleeping because they're getting downloads, to listen because they're getting, they're getting messages. And he wants people to write down their messages because what, uh, what I know the truth is, and what is that if everybody compared, it would be very similar. So uh, God's pouring out his love and his information to everybody right now because the, they think about the great awakening. I don't know, but he is pulling people together because um, um, he said this, he said that there's too many weeds that have taken over and that he said, in order for the righteous and the just to prosper uh, in love, that the weeds had to be plucked out. So, um, so uh, that, love can flourish and the just can take over here. So he, I don't know, something about the balance being off is what he, you know, keeps talking about. So here I am. I think these after effects and these gifts, they still, you know, they, they don't go away and, and we're still part of, I mean, I don't know what you think, you know, Nicole, but these one thing that's not said with near-death experiencers, uh, and I can't say enough, and I think we just forget <laughs> it's not anything intentional, but we're still, we're, we're still connected. I mean, we're, everybody's connected to this, but we're still connected. We're still getting a download. We're still evolving. We're still remembering stuff from over there. We're still a work in process. We're still connected very closely. It's almost like we didn't leave. So um, I think that's just our, our assignment this time, but we are still connected and we are still evolving the people that are near-death experiencers, but you don't have to have a near-death experience to connect to the creator, you know, you just open your heart um, to with with love, and it's just kind of easy. So, um, I don't know if you want to open it up for questions yet. That's kind of a lot of that's a that's a lot to take in. That's a lot of NDEs to take in. <laughs> that sure is a lot of NDEs to take in. And um, <laughs> wow, I thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for. Um, you know, sharing so openly your story because it's not an easy story to share. Um, and as you said, it's even, even recently in life, you know, there are still pieces revealing themselves and becoming clear and, um, and does that ever end? I don't know. But um, so thank you so much. And we can go so many places with that and we will open it to Q and A in a moment. Um, personally, I have lots of things I relate to, especially in one of your NDEs too, which, but anyway, that's, that's, we'll get into that. Oh, well, I must, I must know this. Okay. <laughs> we, we, we have had a similar, the drowning one and the horizon of light, uh, was exactly. Are you serious? You yeah, saw that too? Drowning and horizon of light as well. So when you said that, I, I perked up a little bit. I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really? Did you hear the little choir going on? The little angel choir? I did not. No. Oh, well, well, what if you waited a little longer, maybe. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't wait any longer. <laughs> we I'm glad you're here. Conversation today. <laughs> um, but you know, when you said there that right now, because thanks for bringing it into the current day, that right now, um, through your awareness, the veils are thinner than usual. And I, yeah. I think that provides a very interesting moment that we're in an opportunity. And especially for those who are, empathic, sensitive, mm -hmm. attuned in many different ways. It's, it's an extraordinary time where I know I've spoken with many in this window who are looking for what is happening right now? What is going on? Um, 
So it's wonderful that you speak to that a bit. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that, that, you know, we can talk about things in the past, but I'm still living. It didn't just happen. I mean, it's still evolving in me. We're still evolving, right? We're, I mean, we're processing this pandemic, but, um, you know, I think there's multiple things happening at night. You hear so many people that aren't sleeping, especially in the beginning. My God, you know, I mean, I mean, were you guys sleeping? I wasn't sleeping. I was, I would wake up wide awake and then I'd try to go back to sleep. And I think it's because I, I think what I feel on that, you could say, well, we're getting down a download. Well, yeah, we always get a download at night. I mean, we always do, but I think it's more than that. I think that we love each other and that I, you know, we care about each other and we're united and this planet isn't that big and we care about our brothers and sisters around the world and, and we can't do anything. Our heart just, just, you know, it's just there. So I think we're visiting each other <laughs> at night, check it on each other because it's a big secret. We don't know one another. We've lived forever. Of course we would know each other. Maybe not right now, but on a soul level. So I think that, um, you know, there has been, um, you know, I mean, you look at how the, the, the planet's treated, how it's not respected, how the animals are not respected. You look at how it's okay to be a pedophile. No, it's not. That's not a sexual preference. It's a weirdo. You know, I mean, the, this, the balance is off. So uh, it's, um, it's, it's uh, the pandemic is horrific. I mean, it's horrific. But if there, if there is some good to come out of it, we need to decide what kind of world we want to create. It's our world. Indeed it is. Tamara, for those who want to um, get connected to your work and find out more, particularly about the recent cha channelings um, and other bits. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> let us know where, where do people get in contact with you? And once that's okay. done, we'll, we'll end the recording and we'll move it into Q&A. Oh, okay, sure. Um, so it's totally free. Um, I just, it just felt weird to charge for Jesus. I know people do that, but I just, you know, I just want to give back, but it's under, um, it's under Christ Academy of Love. I was going to do Academy of Love. He came to me in a dream and said, I, I like this better than the school you're starting. I like this better. He said he liked the Academy of Love and it was taken. So I had to go with Christ Academy of Love. So it's ChristAcademyOfLove.com. If you look under channel messages and Jesus speaks, still there are five. There's a sixth one coming out tomorrow. Um, and so, um, and apparently the, the priest asked me, the lady asked me, where is this going? I'm like, I don't know where it's going. I'm just doing what he's telling me to do. But it, 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 it feels like a continued conversation, which is really interesting. Like, like, you know, like it, like it's picking up. So, um, maybe watching it from the beginning, I will tell this, the, uh, the first one is short and sweet. The second one, it really kind of gets into it and it's like a continuation. It's quite interesting. Um, and then the other website that I have is uh, where I'm an evidential psychic medium. And you can see the stuff I do. It's fun. I've got little Southern stuff. I've got little Southern, Southernese. You can learn how to talk Southern. I've got little fun things. It's quirky. It's colorful. I've got a dog in a top hat. I mean, you got to go for at least that. Uh, it's fun. I wanted it to be a fun thing. Um, but it's southernbellmedium.com. And it's Southern Bell, B-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. It's like, you know, like beautiful bell medium.com. So, uh, and then you can get in touch with me there. And I do, I do stage, uh, stage work, um, where I am, uh, I do, for example, a lot in my area, the Southern women show, and we'll have, you know, per show, I do it twice a day at convention centers and I'll have five or 600 people, you know, to pop. And I love when spirit has whole families together. And I'm like, did you not, did you guys know each other? No. And then you'll get all the grandmothers that save their money in coffee cans or all this, or, you know, always get chickens at least once. I have no idea. I think it's some joke spirit does with me. Somebody raises chickens. I have no idea. At least in a weekend, I guess someone raises chicken, but I do, I do that. And to me, I make it fun and entertaining because, um, even though it's very evidential and very detailed, but because Jesus said that people have forgotten to laugh and that uh, I, he needed help with that because he said people take themselves too seriously and that in order for a healing to take place, they need to open up their heart and they need to laugh more. So um, that's something that we can, 
you know, always take in, but yeah. Um, but you know, if you guys know anything in your area, once we get past this, through this crazy, crazy, uh, pandemic thing, I mean, I, I, I travel too. So I, you know, if anything's going on, let me know. We, we look forward when we get to invite you down under and, um, yeah. <laughs> And have you come with color and fun and laughter. Um, you're absolutely right about all of that. So Tamara, thank you so much. Thank you. So thank much. You. Um, we will end the recording here so we can open up for Q&A. Um, so for those watching the playback, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to another Sydney Irons when we see you next. Thank you so much.